All right, welcome back to this uh, second uh, session for this morning. Uh, our next speakers, we have um, two speakers and three presenters, actually. But uh, first up will be Mike Angelic. Mike uh, spent many years working at uh, Eastman Kodak as a chemical and electrical engineer uh, and helped, in, in fact, develop the Cineon digital film system we all are aware of. Uh, he later spent um, 10 years at uh, Lowry Digital Images, leading that group for a while. And he's currently the CEO of Corbisus, a technology company that has developed and serves <coughs> affordable enterprise-grade data storage and computing to the archive world. And joining him will be Alexander Petrukov. He's a professor of mathematics at the University of Georgia. And um, he has been involved in a number of, uh, uh, of areas for research and development for uh, coming up with technologies for film restoration. Uh, he joined Aglosoft in 2005 and developed the uh, technology and software called Viva, which was used in the Metropolis restoration uh, a few years ago. And uh, Ina Koslov is also here, was involved in this uh, project. She, at, at Aglosoft, she also played a key role in design and development of digital film restoration technology. So please welcome Mike Inchelek first. So it's the boring scientific part of the day, I'm afraid. I will keep my eyes open, though, to see if we can keep you all awake. Um, my goal here today is to try to get you to think a little bit differently about restoration, because there's a convergence of technologies that is enabling some pretty remarkable things. And that's what we're here to talk about today, to show you some pictures, um, try and keep it light, technically. Uh, but I'd like to start with a little story. Um, there was a writer who lived on the coast of Normandy, and one night there was a huge storm. And every day, as was his habit, he would walk along the beach. But today, it was littered with millions and millions of starfish that had been washed up on the shore. And he walked very gingerly, picking his way between the fish, trying not to step on any of them, aware that Within an hour or two, the sun would bake them, and they would die, and he was sad about that. But he saw off in the distance a little boy walking toward him, frantically picking up starfish and throwing them back into the water. And as he got closer, he said to the boy, he said, A ton garçon, qu'est-ce que tu fais? Tu ne peux pas tous les sauver? Pourquoi? He said, little boy, there are millions and millions. You can't save them all. What are you doing and why? And as the little boy picked up another starfish and threw it into the water, he said, well, it makes a difference to that one. And when I read that story, it not only touched me, but to me, it was emblematic of what we do, what you do. There is a mountain of culture and history and storytelling to be saved. There's precious little time. There may not be time to save them all, but each one matters. My story today, in fact, is about trying to save as many of those as possible. There are, as we know, hundreds of millions of feet of film, uncountable numbers of videos, that all deserve being saved. The problem we have is that our current methods don't work in enough volume. Parts of the process of restoration are doing their job. The digitization side of things, in fact, has made remarkable improvements over the last decade, in fact, over the last three years. This technology has become extraordinarily more accessible. We used to see scanners like this. They're still available. They're in the quarter of a million, to half a million dollar kind of price range. They have remarkable sets of features, but they were beyond the reach of most of us to apply to our archives. But recently we're seeing smaller and faster and cheaper devices down, many of them under $100,000. 
and we're seeing double and triple flash scanning, for those of you who know what that means, to be able to truly get the full dynamic range off our film, 5K and higher resolution scanning, and remarkable speeds. So digitization, digitization is not the bottleneck anymore. There's another issue, which is that much of our funding comes from tax dollars and donations that are all about making the films that we save usable, putting them online and making them accessible to our publics. Again, the challenge is how to make that happen in a way that we can afford and that practically work. Having worked for quite a while in pristine high-end restoration, I can tell you it's a complex process. I'm not going to go through all of the steps here, but the key, and by the way, this is about half of them, at least in my experience. The process is extremely iterative, meaning you go part way through, you improve the images to a certain point, which then allows you to go back and remove other things. Um, it is a process that requires a lot of capital, a lot of time, a lot of expertise, a lot of money. And the reality is, it's not scalable. We see wonderful things on the high end. They're very important. They're part of what speak out to the world about what's possible, but they don't apply on a grand scale. And in case you're not aware and you don't work in this space, these kinds of restorations cost hundreds of thousands of dollars at the very high end, millions at the very highest end. They take two to 10 man years of resources. I've worked on projects that took 30 man years. And that's not elapsed time, that's groups of 20 or 30 people working for two to eight months. When you're trying to scan a film a day to get your archive digitized, those kind of schedules just don't work. And more than that, that list of all the process steps I talked about require experts of different types experts in all kinds of imaging, as well as IT and other issues. So, it's not really practical to find more time. We don't have it, or more budget. And we would literally need hundreds of thousands of experts to get through our resources, our archives, as a, as a worldwide community. So, we can't base the solution on manpower. We have to have another way to look at this. And part of that, by the way, is not just how we approach the problem, but the unfortunate fact of the matter at the moment is we also can't have a 100% quality bar. That may make sense if you have titles that have commercial value where people are willing to pay good money to see this. But otherwise, like any other technological endeavor, getting that last 5% quality often costs two, three, four times more than it took to get the first 95 percent. And we have to leverage that. So what we need to do is we need to find a way to leverage automation. We need to find a way to leverage something other than labor without losing track of the artistic and other goals that we have. And that's our dream. The team that's here to talk with you today and to share some results, our dream is that Every film can be processed just like every film can be and needs to be scanned. And it's not as outlandish a thought as you might think, because most people are not aware of how much processing actually goes on in a scanner. To stabilize, to find the perfs, to correct for uneven lighting, to correct for, um, for sensors that are not perfect. And um, where they have to make internal corrections to deal with sharpening for lenses that you go through, etc. So this idea of processing isn't, um, uh, isn't something to be feared, it's something to be embraced. What we want to leverage is something called Moore's Law, and most of you probably have heard of it before, probably you know it more intimately than I. Moore's Law um, says that essentially every 18 to 24 months, computer processing, and as he originally talked about it, in, uh, represented in the number of transistors on a chip, will double. What that means in real, um, in real terms is that the speed of processing doubles every 18 to 24 months. 
And this is kind of an interesting graphic, just as an aside, you'll see how consistent the improvements of these kind of chips have been from essentially the 1950s all the way up to where we are now. And you see our very fastest processors shortly should have as much processing capability as a mouse brain. And as you know, if you read anything about artificial intelligence, we're all starting to worry about what happens when they eclipse the ability of the human brain. But what we're really trying to leverage here is more and more speed. And you'll see the axis on the left there is calculations per second per thousand dollars. So what it really means is computation is getting cheaper by a factor of two every 18 to 24 months. And it's actually better than that. It turns out that most image processing today is done in the graphics, uh, the graphical processing unit instead of what's called the CPU. So if you've got uh, kids and they play video games, nowadays all of those are rendered on a chip in the video card instead of by the main computer. That change of using image processing in the graphics processors has a remarkable impact. The first is, if you take a look at that red line or the blue line, you can see that the speed increases we're getting out of graphic processors are accelerating even faster than the computer, the basic processing unit. So we're going to get more than a doubling of every uh, 18 to 24 months. We're seeing more like four times the processing eight, every 18 to 24 months. And more than that, if you build an operation to use computers to do your restoration, all you have to do is switch the video card out every 18 to 24 months for $300 instead of build new computers. It is a remarkable change in economics. Labor, wherever we get it done, if we have people painting our pixels, whether it be here in the United States, in India, or in China, those labor rates will always go up. It will never be cheaper than it is now. So we have to harness this technology. So, bottom line is, we have to leverage automation. We have to leverage computing. And there's one other thing, and it's, it's uh, embodied in the title of our paper, which is the learnings from big data all of the advances in trying to extract features and information from pictures that can enable that to happen. And this graphic basically just says, wow, as an industry, we have a tremendous amount of data to go through. The amount of data, as you know, if you work in this space in a movie, is in the terabyte range. We have tons and tons of titles to work with. Um, and when all of this comes together, there's a lot to extract. What we're here to talk about today is some new capabilities, some new future features that we've been able to develop, where they come from, show you some images because in the end it comes down to what can automation really deliver you that's practical, and then talk briefly about the future. Embodied in the software, if I could have, I'd have brought a staples that's easy button because that's exactly what this is meant to be. That green button is all you do to run this automation. The computer does the rest. If you take a look at the difference between both what was in Viva technology 10 years ago versus now and what, what was in other technologies on the right hand side, the upper right is what everyone's been able to do for a fair amount of time dealing with dust and scratches, um, very labor intensive, um, some artifact problems, and a very slow process. Right now, we're in a position where we can remove numerically 95% or more of the defects automatically. The computer looks at the footage, the computer analyzes what needs to be done, the computer sets its own parameters, the computer delivers the results for a human being to deal with. Let me talk a little bit about what's in it. Um, uh, this uh, parameter setting I just described, it's called adaptive, meaning that the computer does the analysis and makes the decisions itself. It removes the need for an expert to fine tune things. That's one of the biggest costs of restoration today is the is the repetitive processing and reprocessing of materials to get the best possible results. Motion estimation is what underlies the technologies in all of these kinds of restoration products. You basically have to track everything going on in each frame of a film to determine what doesn't belong. 
and the better you can track it, the better job you can do of recognizing what doesn't belong, both because you can remove more of what you don't want, and you will make fewer mistakes by removing things that belong there. Um, there's a, a technology we call Super Flicker, but deals with um, grain reduction, flicker, and color breathing. Those are among the most difficult processing and restoration tasks out there. These new algorithms, I think you will see, uh, make a remarkable difference. Um, dust removal and stabilization are already there, but are now fully uh, controlled by uh, this very powerful one-button restoration. And the last thing that's really important, but I want to talk about after we look at some images, is undo. And I'll just give you uh, a window into that, which is that no computer ever, and I hate to say that, will, will be able to perfectly decide what doesn't belong in an image and, and what does. More than that, no computer should ever decide what the image structure of a picture should look like, exactly what grain level and look you're trying to achieve. That's an archivist's job. That belongs to the person who's making the judgment about whether they're trying to replicate the view of the content when it was first released, or to match some intermediate aged element, or what. So it's a partnership of computer and, and human being where the human being has to have the ability essentially to peel back the layers of the onion to get to the version they want without lots of recomputation and other things. And that's what this powerful undo is all about. So, we're going to look at some images, and I'm going to have to actually break out of this to pull the first set of images up from the desktop. So, give me a second, please. If you'd come up, that'd be terrific. Uh, just a few examples of uh, green button restoration, which is the green technology. What's your microphone? Uh, uh, some of them uh, use uh, preliminary discretion mode here. For example, it's just pure uh, automatic mode with uh, one button uh, click. This is uh, footage uh, 1922 from Poland. Uh, Got it from Pixar film. Then, uh, next one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You know, uh, sorry, let me. Uh, yep, yeah. no, I gotta do this. There we go. Now I'll be right there. Yeah, I'm using it. It's. Uh, I think it might be loading. Give me one second. All right, there we go. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, this is uh, arrived to us as a whole movie, but probably uh, this is uh, some kind of documentary uh, from 60s. Uh, so we have scratch here, it's separate mode, goes before green button processing, and then uh, uh, absolutely automatic. Then maybe uh, it's fragment of the uh, same movie, just want to show what's going on in uh, dark areas. Uh, 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 this is quite difficult scratch. Uh, uh, why it's difficult? Because it goes uh, through uh, hard texture, and uh, probably if you try to see where it is, uh, I don't know, I cannot see. Uh, uh, so this is the scratch tool and uh, green button after that. Uh, this case is uh, computer finds about 100 scratches on the left side. So scratch goes first and then uh, green button over, over a very short sequence. Oh, no. Uh, uh, could you please disappear? Uh, uh, two uh, pieces of footage from uh, Polish film, 1932. Again, we got that from uh, fix a field. <coughs> so uh, again, uh, scr the scratch tool and last green button processing after all. Uh, and the second half is a little bit different. 
of is it loop? Can, can you go to next? Excuse me, can you run next, please? Which one should do? Okay. Again, uh, the scratch uh, plus a green button. Actually, it can be done uh, pretty fast on my laptop. It costs maybe a uh, couple of frames per second. Uh, and stabilization at the end. Uh, again, absolutely automatic. All parameters are computed uh, inside software. Yeah, I think all that Bob and weave right out. It's rock steady. That's great. Okay, and can you run now uh, White Zombie, please? Next one. Uh, this is. Uh, just beginning a few minutes of uh, White Zone in 1932, uh, we just wanted to show uh, that software can be run for entire film with different defects, with different quality of footage because it's low budget <laughs> film. Uh, so in different places uh, we have different quality, some optical transitions and so on. Uh, let us see, I don't know, three, four minutes of this. Uh, by the way, quite interesting noise on the, on the left. It looks like paper noise. Sound isn't restored, it's from original skin. one of possible options for automation. In 30 seconds, please uh, switch to four minutes ahead. Just a moment. You know why is the house of the city of Omar? Can you switch uh, for minutes? Zombie! 
it's impossible just to rewind. So stop, stop it, please. It's a long piece. Uh, okay, and uh, return this to turn control. And this is uh, uh, one sample which we cannot which we cannot uh, process with green button. This is a paper print uh, from Library of Congress, uh, 1905. It was shot by um, uh, American uh, mutoscope and biograph. Uh, so this is absolutely automatic processing, but it's not green button. So. A computer doesn't know yet how to work with paper prints. It's not very common. Uh, but uh, what is different? We just uh, apply a few runs, maybe twice longer processing, and some parameters uh, was set uh, manually for those passes. And that was done. Okay. So just a couple of com a couple of comments, um, and then to kind of conclude. First off, when you come to events like this, you're used to seeing restorations that have a professional colorist, for example, involved. That's what high-end restorations involve. In fact, that's often where two-thirds of the value of a restoration come from. None of this had that. If you have good eyes, you already know that. We did not apply. There was no colorist associated with this. So all the, uh, all that was done was a little bit of contrast to help see deeper into the images for artifacts for the purpose of this demo. Um, and as Alex mentioned, right now we're doing a very good job with one button restoration on the kinds of image challenges and image types that the computer's seen a lot of because it's had a chance to learn. Paper print, brand new situation. So the algorithms we know can handle it, that was the purpose of that last demonstration, but it's not yet smart enough to do it adaptively. And of course that's part of the the moving target for us. Um, I'll quickly finish up on this concept of undo and then talk about the future. So when it comes to undo, there are really three reasons for it. The first is to take mistakes out because computers will never be as good as human beings. The best example I can give you uh, is, for example, a woman wearing a diamond earring who turns and for one frame catches the light and you get a perfect white reflection that is indistinguishable from dirt as far as the computer is concerned. If you don't want it removing that, it's going to leave lots of other pieces of dirt. An undo feature that allows you to just say, put that back, and allow it to do it in an intelligent way is extremely powerful. In restorations, those of you who work in a day in and day out know how much work there is to do that. You can't just paint back the original. That's what a lot of people will try to do. But the original you paint back now has a different grain level, may have been adjusted for flicker, so it's got different luminance. This kind of powerful undo allows you to just touch the feature and remove it. Then there's creative control, which I alluded to before. The archivist needs to be in control of what the real goal here is, not the computer saying, I can remove this much. Right? That's what is uh, involved in setting up that green button and in the undo. And lastly, without this powerful undo, you have a lot more rework to do and a lot more complex process. So it's extremely important. And what I have for you is an example here that will uh, be hard to see, so I'm just going to fly through it, but to show you the degree of control that's in this undo. As all of you can clearly see, that's Shirley Temple's head on the left. <laughs> Um, she is turning quickly. It is the last frame of a sequence. Again, in restoration, when you're at the beginning or the end and you're doing motion estimation, there's nothing following it to figure it out. And as a result, the computer has made a small mistake, and if you look very carefully, there's a pattern in the grain, a color pattern in the grain, between Shirley's head and the object on the right. The reality is, um, I'm sorry, that was the original. Now you can see that there is an artifact that's been baked in, and the degree of control you have in this undo is not just taking out or replacing a piece of dirt or other thing that was removed, but the ability to peel back the artifacts themselves through a bunch of controls, which I won't explain today for lack of time. 
that are up on the left hand side. So, what does all this mean? The first thing is we believe that this vision for doing massive high volume preservation and restoration must involve high degrees of automation to have a chance of touching those same images we're digitizing and making them usable to the general public. We think this is a really important first step. We ourselves are amazed at how much can be improved in these images automatically, and there's more to go. The other thing, which is kind of a second story, is that even if you're doing high-end pristine restorations, we're convinced with this path of technology that you're better off making a first pass completely automatically removing that 90 to 95 percent of the artifacts and then spending your elbow grease and manpower on going the last five percent of the time rather than going through the entire project in that iterative labor intensive way. So we think this applies in two ways. What's next? Well, the reality is there are always more things to work on. Um, Certainly more advanced motion estimation should allow us to get that 95% to 97% to 98%. Remember, I don't think ever to 100, but I've been proven wrong before. Um, Dewarping and video problems are ones we have not turned to yet, but should be equally solvable. And lastly, certainly color correction. And we don't think a colorist ever gets cut out of this process but an automatic color correction, especially for things that are not scene to scene color corrected with all the problems of shooting over multiple days and making them look the same. That kind of technology is really important for um, newsreel footage and sports footage and a lot of the other stuff that basically will have faded and changed by the reel and, not, um, and, and be very well served by some automation. So that's the next horizon for us. Um, one last comment is that this idea of getting computers to learn and of building better algorithms is built on having to have a great library of problems and new problems. And you guys unearth those all the time. So um, if you're interested, if you have footage you would like us to take a whack at or to use and we can use it in an R&D mode to evolve these features further, please come see us. We are always interested in those because that's how we raise the bar for all of us and build the tool that will help us all. So, thank you very much. By the way, no one do was applied for those samples, for those things. <laughs> okay, a couple of quick questions here for me. Um, for, for all the sent samples, uh, were those all from prints? Were all were the source materials for the, your for your before and after samples? Were all of the source materials prints? Was the film stock print or negative or a mixture? We some people, in most of cases we just don't know. We are people from. Uh, Okay. And is it a variety of scanning techniques or all yeah, one? Absolutely different sources. So. Okay. It's all from customers who sent in the kind of challenge for this that we've okay. talked about yes. here. And in many right. cases, we didn't ask that question. So for the after uh, sample, was there any uh, post-automated processing manual intervention no. at all? Everything you see here is the result of automation and not even any undo. Okay. It is straight out first pass. All right. I'm a little curious about the geometric difference in the images, the after images, uh, because there was often, you know, it was, I don't know if it's, if you made any manipulation to, you know, get your images side by side, but it was often kind of uh, squeezed on the right, on the after. Uh, Is that a anomaly from the processing or? I don't know, maybe this is a problem of clip, but it, it doesn't have to be. Okay. No squeeze. Because it's just the only thing I can think of, but I'd like to actually look at it in more yeah. detail and mm -hmm. can look at it with you, is that um, obviously one of the things that happens when you apply automatic stabilization is that you have the problem then that you, 
for example, if one, if one image is shifted over 100 pixels and you shift it back where it belongs, you now have a gap. And so you actually have to crop down so that you never see those edges or whatever. It could be an artifact of, of that nature. But, but I'm but not sure. Some of footage uh, was uh, warped, so maybe you can you don't have time to switch and you see it working on one side at that moment. You have working on other side. We'll have to lay them up um, and be able to uh, we can yeah, double expose them and take a look at, at how they question over here. Um, is this a resolution independent software? Uh, 2K plus. Oh, after 4K plus, for uh, some three hundred. I guess the the issue, and, and this is going on with graphics cards, of course, for graphics cards to have their, their okay. speed, um, you have to be able to fit the images, and since you're doing temporal, meaning over time processing, you have to be able to fit into the graphics cards. So there's nothing about the software that is resolution specific at all. It's merely a matter of computing logistics. <coughs> Question over here. And two frames per second, uh, that's for laptop for 2K. Of course, for 4K, it will be slower. Mm -hmm. is, this, oh, sorry. is this a software that you are providing as a service? And if so, where? Or is it a software that you're selling? No, most, mostly we don't provide service. Uh, from time to time, for difficult cases, some kind, uh, sometimes people ask us. It's, it's software for sale. And, and uh, at times, if there's a really difficult shot, Alex and Nina will, uh, will give some help or develop something on the fly for it. That's how we get better. Question right here. Does the software keep track of all the changes that have been made? And if so, how does it do that? And how can the human then read uh, the record? Uh, there is track of uh, does Buster, of course. Uh, but for uh, Super Filter, no. You just can compare and return uh, uh, whatever you want, and the degree of return depends on you with this undo. Right. There isn't a log per se in that sense, but you can choose to output intermediate stages. So even though this is all executed at once, stabilization is conceptually a different process than uh, dirt which is, is different than um, scratches, which is different than flicker, et cetera. So in fact, you can have stored those intermediates so, so you can peel back between them. And actually, definitely we cannot uh, track completely what uh, is done with super filter because it's changed each pixel. Mm -hmm. Question over here. What, what platforms does this run on? Windows. Just Windows, okay, thank you. Windows and NVIDIA GPU only. How do you judge grain like and, um, and the sharpening? Uh, by the way, no sharpening uh, over there, absolutely, of course, uh, just process. But uh, about grain, grain is estimated and uh, software tries to remove it, uh, in fact, completely within uh, frames, uh, within framework, uh, how many uh, reference frames you have. But uh, you said attenuation which is corresponds to your taste. You can create uh, this green button uh, configuration file which corresponds to your taste. And it will leave gray on the level you like. At the end, you can process this very aggressively and remove everything, I mean, uh, gray noise. And after all, you can use batch mode of undo to set necessary level of uh, gray. But this is not regrain, this is natural gray, which will go back. Moreover, you can do, for example, if you have uh, Super 8 footage, you can apply uh, uh, undo and get uh, something like uh, 70 millimeter output appearance. Um, let me add a little bit to that too. There's, there's kind of, um, two, broadly speaking, two different um, extremes in how you can handle grain. One is to try to, uh, tends to be, uh, to try and remove all the grain and then put back what you want, you know, synthesize grain of the look you want. Um, and an awful lot of people do that. Um, this approach is somewhat different in that what you essentially do is, is say, I would like 80% of the grain that's there. 80% meaning 
whatever essentially the uh, the contrast was of the original grain pieces, make it 80% of that, or 60% of that, or 40% of that. And you actually have a lot more control than that. You can say, because I really don't like that horsey large grain and I'm trying to achieve something that's much more like the original camera negative, give me 10% of the big grain, but 80% of the small grain. And you can control all those things together. And as Alex said, you actually can go in after the fact and change your mind because it has computed um, some basic things from which you can, in a color suite, which is my green, right, essentially manage, uh, no, manage your noise level and profile as well as sharpening, which is the next horizon too. Not, I hate to use that word, uh, super, uh, super resolution, detail enhancement kinds of things. One more, one more question, I guess. Uh, you sort of answered my question, I think, which was going to be, can you, uh, before you run the green button, can you say, I don't want to process grain, or so, any, yes. again, define uh, what you want to actually do? Uh, in configuration files, there is a configuration which is not automatic. It is called attenuation. And if you set for grain frequency, for grain spectrum, but do not touch it, it will not be touched. But actually, it's not somehow recommended because if you leave grain uh, from the beginning, you cannot remove uh, dust and dirt efficiently. So maybe better to do the same but in different order. We remove grain, remove dust, and then return same grain. Right. And, and uh, I will wrap up, but I just make one That's comment to that. To those of you, again, depending on how, how directly you, you practice in this, um, the idea is you're estimating motion to figure out what doesn't belong, to reduce the grain and dirt. As you do those things, you then have a cleaner image to do a better job of estimating the motion to decide what's grain and dirt, to decide how much to leave, which allows you to do better motion, etc. So because the undo is powerful and fast, as Alex said, you're better off reducing the grain to be able to see the other artifacts, remove them then put your brain back into the level that aesthetically you want, including all the way back to the original. Thank you very much. Thank you.